My name is Rachel Brand. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Federalist Society, we are a membership organization of lawyers and law students that provides a forum for rigorous debate on issues of law and legal policy. For many of us in the room, this is the organization that brought to our law schools diverse perspectives on issues of law and legal policy that weren't otherwise reflected on campus and that continues to provide informative and provocative programming on a variety of legal issues all through the year. I'm standing here today because I'm chairman of the litigation practice group of the Federalist Society. My practice group planned the panel that you are about to hear. The Federal Society has 15 practice groups divided by subject matter, and they are responsible for a large portion of the programming hosted by the organization throughout the year. For those of you who might be interested in getting more involved in the organization, I'd make a pitch for you to get involved in one of the practice groups. If you're interested in that, you can come and find me afterwards, or you can find Dean Reuter, who's here at the front table, who's on the Federal Society staff and runs the practice groups. I've been asked to remind you that certain of the panel conferences, including this one, are being live streamed on the blog of the Federalist Society. So if you can't be here in person for the whole conference, you don't have to miss out entirely. And with that, I'd like to turn to our topic today. I'm very delighted with the panel that we put together. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. The panelists that are going to reflect today on the first decade of the Roberts Court come from diverse perspectives. We have a journalist, an academic, a practitioner, and a former Senate staffer. So thank you all for being here. With that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Judge Carlos Fea of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Thank you, Judge Fea. Thank you, uh, Rachel, for that uh, invitation, uh, for that introduction. Uh, the 10 years that uh, Chief Justice Roberts has led the court have seen decisions that have affected important aspects of our cultural, religious, and political lives. Our panel today will discuss and deal not only with the Chief Justice, uh, but also uh, at the nomination process and what effect he's had on the other justices and whether it should be called the Roberts Court, or perhaps the Kennedy Court, or some people might say the Alito Court. In the Ninth Circuit, we might refer to it as the Court of Reversal. <laughs> <coughs> because over those 10 years, the Supreme Court has reversed the Ninth Circuit in 78% of the appeals that it accepted from our circuit. Um, to paraphrase, <laughs> to paraphrase a former Solicitor General, it has been suggested that one could open a cert petition by saying, this is a petition to review a judgment of the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and there are other reasons also to reverse. <laughs> but enough about the Ninth Circuit. Our panelists will discuss the important decisions which are seen as consistent with the judicial philosophy of the Roberts Court and how those perhaps have brought surprises to the presidents who have nominated the justices. We have a distinguished panel with us today and we'll hear uh, from each panelist. The panelists will then exchange questions and then I'll take questions from the audience. First, we have Stephen Duffield, Duffield, a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Stephen is Vice President for Policy at Crossroads GPS and President of the End Game Strategies here in Washington. Stephen worked for Senator John Kyle on the Senate Republican Policy Committee during the then Judge Roberts nomination and confirmation. Stephen is going to discuss the expectations regarding Judge Roberts' role as Chief Justice at the time he was confirmed in 2005. Next, we have Jan Crawford, who is the Chief Legal Correspondent for CBS News and also a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Jan covers the Supreme Court regularly and published a book in 2007 entitled Supreme Conflict, The Inside Story of the Struggle for Control of the United States Supreme Court. Jan is going to speak about how Justice Roberts' tenure on the court has coincided with and diverged from public expectations at the time he was confirmed. 
We're also joined by Mike Carvin, a partner at Jones Day. Mike has argued numerous cases before the Supreme Court. Mike is going to discuss some of the hot button issues that have arisen during Chief Justice Roberts' tenure, including the Affordable Care Act and affirmative action cases. Last but not least, we have uh, Professor Michael Paulson. Michael is a professor at the University of St. Thomas School of Law in Minnesota. He has written extensively on constitutional interpretation. Michael is knowledgeable about the court's religious freedom jurisprudence. He has two degrees from Yale, one in divinity. And he will offer some thoughts on the direction that the Supreme Court might take during the next presidential administration. With that, let's begin with our first panelist, Stephen Duffield. Thank you, Judge Bea. Uh, I'm honored to be a part of this panel today. I was a lawyer in the Senate for Senator John Kyle in his leadership office during a truly crazy time in judicial nominations, 2003 to 2006. For those who weren't caught up in that particular vortex, that period included Democrats' wholly unprecedented filibuster of lower court nominees, such as Miguel Estrada, Priscilla Owen, and others, the Republican threat to eliminate the judicial filibuster of lower court nominees, uh, of all nominees, pardon me, uh, in what is now called the nuclear option, the infamous Gang of 14 partial settlement of that dispute, the nominations of John Roberts and Samuel Alito, and the sobering experience with another nomination. I have been invited to set the stage for how it was that John Roberts was viewed in the Senate and what the expectations were for him from the perspective of the senators who confirmed him. Obviously, I don't speak for any senator, but these are my good faith impressions of that experience. So let's go back to the summer of 2005. The most important thing to understand is that there was a great deal of concern that any Supreme Court nominee would be blocked by filibuster. Republicans had just 55 votes. Many of us believed that Democrats would hold together to block all but the most moderate of nominees, nominees who conservative senators themselves could not support. In other words, we feared some disaster. As a consequence of this fear, Senate and administration staff spent many months working on how to frame a Supreme Court nomination, any nomination. The arguments would be the same, regardless of who it was. In fact, I'm sure everyone recalls then Judge Roberts' analogy of judging as umpires, as calling balls and strikes. Well, the first time I heard that analogy was not from Judge Roberts, but a few months before the O'Connor resignation, sitting in then Majority Leader Bill Frist's conference room. A fellow Republican counsel shared the analogy in almost precisely the same language that Judge Roberts would later use. Now, I suppose it's possible that the White House and DOJ staff in the room, taking very careful notes, never shared this idea or this phrasing or framing with Judge Roberts, but color me a little bit skeptical. So if you don't like the analogy, and I know many of you do not, uh, just do what you'd like to do, just blame Congress. <laughs> now keep in mind, there were real substantive consequences to this fear of the filibuster and the focus on messaging and framing. It meant there was far less attention given, on the Republican side at least, to understanding the nuances of John Roberts' precise judicial philosophy. Instead, we were working on how to shape the debate to prevent a filibuster. So let's go back to the timeline. The inconclusive Gang of 14 agreement is reached in May, and Justice O'Connor announces her resignation, uh, her retirement rather, uh, in July. The president nominates John Roberts soon after. Now from the outset, one thing was clear. Senators really liked John Roberts. They thought he was brilliant, but they also just liked his style. My personal view, I've always said this, is that Judge Roberts excited many senators because he reminded them so much of what they wished they could be themselves. Brilliant, somebody who was smooth, cool under pressure, and a phenomenal communicator. They wished they could be more like him. But at the same time, few at the time, at least in the Senate, were saying that the president had replaced Justice O'Connor with a Justice Thomas or a Justice Scalia. At the outset especially, Judge Roberts was considered an improvement over Justice O'Connor, a very good choice for the O'Connor spot. Enthusiasm grew as vetting continued and the left became more vocal in opposition. Now in retrospect, I think we all should agree that he was a substantial improvement. So after eight weeks of waiting, the passing of the former Chief Justice and the nomination of Judge Roberts to that role, the hearings occurred in the Russell, now the Kennedy, caucus room. 
John Roberts sat patiently while 18 senators made opening statements to the cameras, and then he leaned forward and gave a brief statement of his own that stunned everyone with its eloquence. The balls and strikes metaphor made its first public appearance, as did the promise not to be a politician or to have an agenda. There was the beautiful language about his childhood in the endless fields of Indiana and their promise of endless possibilities. He was formidable, and the fight, if there ever was to be one, was over that day. The next two days of Q&A were just defense by the nominee, but also by most Republican senators. Judge Roberts gave us earnest repetitions of doctrines and tests that proved absolute mastery of the law, but showed relatively little in the way of specific judicial philosophy. It was also rather dry. At the Alito hearings a few months later, Joe Biden clowned around with a Princeton cap on his head and spoke 26 and a half of his 30 minutes before he even asked a question. We, we kept track. I must say, we did learn that Judge Roberts' favorite movies were, as we all know, Dr. Zhivago and North by Northwest. Perhaps nothing illustrates the prosaic nature of the hearings better than Judge Roberts' answer to Senator Graham's simple question. He asked, what would you like history to say about you? Characteristically, Judge Roberts' first response was a bit cheeky. He said, I have my hearing transcript. He said, I'd like him to start by saying he was confirmed, Perfect, right? The audience laughed. And then he said, but actually, the answer is the same. He said, I would like them to, them to say I was a good judge. But what did that mean? We didn't really know, except that there was a very firm sense that Judge Roberts was adamant that judges should not bring their policy preferences into judging. But of course, Democratic nominees today say all the same. Senators saw they were getting a very smart man who, contrary to his opening statement, was an excellent politician, just in a very different field. The staff conversations after Judge Roberts would do his private meetings with their senators were always the same. Wow, that guy's good. <coughs> and people were incredibly impressed. There was a sense that he would be an institutionalist, that, that he truly loved the court, but I'm not sure that any senator actually had any idea on what that would mean in practice. It's interesting then in this vein to look to something he said in his opening statement. This is towards the, the very end of the statement. He said, if I am confirmed, I will be vigilant to protect the independence and integrity of the Supreme Court, and I will work to ensure that it upholds the rule of law and safeguards those liberties that make this land one of endless possibilities for all Americans. So a concern for the court, and then coupled with a concern for the rule of law and liberties. But at least in this sentence, he placed them in parallel. Let me also read what he had to say about results-oriented judging. During questioning from Senator Cornyn, Judge Roberts said that if a judge is results-oriented, quote, it's about the worst thing you could say, because what you're saying is you don't apply the law to tell you what the results should be. You don't go through the judicial, judicial decisional process. You don't look to the principles that are established in the Constitution or the law. You look to what you think the result should be, and then you go back and try to rationalize it. And that's not the way the system is supposed to work. Well, to embrace the elephant in the room, these words are somewhat interesting given popular conceptions of his approach in both of the Obamacare cases. But those comments should also be read in light of his vehement dissent in Obergefell, the same-sex marriage case. But I'm going to let others sort that out. <laughs> the transcript provides other clues. He did not adopt a strict textualism, but just said that, of course, a judge should start with the text. In response, again, to Senator Cornyn, he said, I think you folks, I think that when you folks legislate, you do have something in mind in particular, and you put it into words, and you expect judges not to put in their own preference, not to substitute their judgment for you, but to implement your view of what you are accomplishing in the statute. And then a few lines later, he says, I think there is meaning in your legislation, and the job of a good judge is to do as good a job as possible to get the right answer. This nuance was not pursued by senators of either party. The more time you spend with the hearing transcript, the more clues like this you see, but in fairness, this kind of ex post exegesis is maybe another style of looking around the room to find your friends. What matters is that the, the senators heard what they wanted and needed to hear. No agenda, no politics, limited role of judging, a desire for unanimity, rejection of results-oriented judging. 
And wh what they were left with at core was an institutionalist who was hostile to judges inserting themselves into policymaking. And when you look back on it just over 10 years later, it may well be that this is exactly what we got. Thank you. Um, I think when we think about the Roberts Court, I'm going to just ask just to, again, think back 10 years, and this may cause kind of a lot of pain, but if you remember how much excitement that there was, um, because President Bush had really been given an historic opportunity to change the Supreme Court in a way that his father had failed to do so, and even President Reagan. Um, as you all know, I mean, the story of the Supreme Court and certainly the Rehnquist Court has been one of, of disappointment for conservatives. The Rehnquist Court, seven of nine justices nominated by Republican presidents, yet in case after case after case, those justices failed to adhere to conservative judicial principles. Uh, many victories for liberals, uh, as we don't really need to get into here after lunch. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, why was that? I mean, obviously, some of the justices weren't as conservative um, as people had hoped. Uh, and when I say conservative, I'm, I, I know that's a, a frustrating term, but I'm just referring to judicial conservatism principles. Um, you know, the, they were never that conservative to begin with. Of course, that would be the story of, of Justice Souter. I mean, he looked conservative, and he wore three-piece suits and was really polite, um, <laughs> but he had no real uh, philosophy. Uh, others really changed when they got on the court and uh, perhaps didn't have that strong mo mooring to begin with, but of course, that would be the story of, of Justice Kennedy, Justice O'Connor. Um, and failed to provide, in many cases, uh, the key votes that would have uh, started to turn the court back in a more conservative direction and away from some of the excesses of the Warren Court. And then, I mean, still other justices who did have strong conservative philosophical views, I think, affected the court in very unexpected ways. That, of course, is the story of Justice Thomas, who I believe is uh, really been the most egregiously mischaracterized figure, probably, in our generation. Um, and I've written about this a lot in the book, and it's very interesting because the story of Justice Thomas um, is a one, as we all know, where he, um, you know, the, the narrative is that he is a, a lackey of Justice Scalia. He's Scalia's, you know, intellectual understudy. He's inferior uh, intellectually. And of course, that narrative is demonstrably false, is, is obvious uh, not only by reading his opinions, but uh, it's in the papers uh, of Justice Blackman in the Library of Congress. You can see Thomas taking key positions uh, on his own in conference, and then Scalia later changing his vote to join Justice Thomas. Um, and it's funny, when I talk about this in speeches, uh, depending on the audience, especially on the West Coast, <laughs> the Ninth Circuit, I'll start to talk about Justice Thomas um, because I, I, I think it really is an outrage uh, the way he continues to be perceived in the press. And uh, people will be all excited, like, oh, what is she going to say, you know, piling on Justice Thomas? And I start to tell these stories, and it's almost to a person. People will, no one wants to hear it. Um, and that, I think, is a, a tremendous uh, disservice to a man, but it's also been done by my profession. Um, and, and it's something I think is outrageous. But his uh, tenure on the court, I think, has ex affected the court in unexpected ways. He, I think, in many ways caused Justice O'Connor, with his strong conservative views, to drift more to the left than she already was. Certainly, she was going that way. Um, so the Rehnquist Court was, was, was a disappointment for conservatives, and here was George Bush with this historic opportunity uh, to do what previous presidents had failed to do, uh, which became obvious when Justice O'Connor shocked everyone by announcing that she was stepping down before the Chief Justice. So he had to get it right uh, and relied on, I think, um, some very smart people. And in tapping John Roberts, and that was taking us all back, um, I, the, the rap then, and it's really funny because it's almost like we've kind of come full circle, like who is John Roberts? 
Uh, ten years ago, I was one who, and I've argued with a lot of you in this room, including on this panel, uh, <laughs> ten years ago about whether or not John Roberts was going to be this solid judicial conservative. I was convinced that he was. Um, I remember at others or not, um, and I remember even members of, of, of the press, I remember vividly uh, in the Supreme Court press room, reporters were saying, he's not that conservative, he's not that conservative, you know, because he was really nice and he would talk to them and return their calls and, you know, he gave them their cell phone number, so like a conservative would never do that because they're so mean. Um, <laughs> So, but I didn't, you know, I was like, yeah, right, you know, I know this guy and he is going to be solid. Um, and then when, remember when the um, memos came out that he had written in the Reagan administration and they were like kind of snarky, uh, you know, his comments on the margins suggested that he was really conservative. I called a member who's sitting on this panel and said, see, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> um, and, you know, he waltzed through uh, his, as Stephen just recounted, I mean, waltzed through his, his confirmation hearings. But who was John Roberts? I mean, look, here we are. We're still talking about some of his decisions. I mean, they, they, you know, they're, they're hard to figure. I think it's fascinating. We'll get into more of the details as this, this unfolds. But it's fascinating when you think about how he would rule in Obamacare and same-sex marriage. But those decisions, I think, in his mind would be completely, completely, uh, you know, complementary and, and not at all inconsistent because as he testified, courts should not reach out and take on social disputes. Courts should take a back seat to legislature. So he would say that everything, this is perfectly consistent with his testimony. Um, but the other thing about John Roberts, if you go back and look at his testimony in 2003, when he was confirmed uh, to the DC circuit, he had a really interesting exchange about whether he was a strict constructionist. And some of the Republican senators were concerned that, you know, what was he? And was he really going to be in the mold of, say, Scalia or Thomas uh, and, and follow some of those principles? And he would not engage at all. Uh, you know, he said he doesn't like labels. Uh, that's not, and strict constructionism can mean one thing in one case and one thing in another. And Hugo Black could be a strict constructionist, and that's meaningless. So, you know, at the time, you thought, well, he's, that's a very savvy answer. Um, but John Roberts doesn't like labels, and he, we can see right now in this panel will show, uh, he defies them in many ways. Um, of course, I think the other nomination that, that President Bush made, and we're gonna talk not just about John Roberts, but the Roberts Court more broadly, uh, was Samuel Alito, and that was an absolute home run. Um, Alito's opinions are beautifully written. His um, presence on the bench has been an enormous asset to the court. Uh, his questions at oral argument are penetrating and completely different, uh, in some ways unexpected, than some of the other justices. And my favorite thing about watching Justice Alito on the bench is how often Justice Kennedy will jump in and ask an attorney, what is your answer to Justice Alito's question? Um, so I think that <laughs> Justice Alito uh, has been, from uh, President Bush's perspective, uh, the, the one, the home run, and of course, replacing Justice O'Connor, a very pivotal vote for the future of this court. Um, but what is the Roberts Court after 10 years? And it's, to me, it's even almost too soon to say now, uh, with the two new justices, how they will affect dynamics on the court, because a new justice, as y'all know, makes a new court. When we saw Justice Thomas come on the court, a solid uh, vote, that changed the dynamics on that court. Uh, so I think it, in many ways it's too soon to tell. I thought about writing another book um, and, and was encouraged to do so by my publisher after five years and decided not to because I think it's too soon. You know, there's a snapshot that you can take of the court in a term in five years and 10 years and Lord knows we got a lot to talk about today after 10 years, but I think that snapshot is being developed. It is not set yet. Um, and what will be very interesting is going forward because as this court established itself and its identity and how we want to talk about it and whether or not it has any consistent themes, whether Roberts has any consistent approaches, uh, this court is going to change. And when you talk about a presidential election in 2016, uh, the next president could well get two, three, 
possibly four appointments after a reelection. Four of the justices in the next president's first term will be in their 80s. Um, and these are conservative justices who could very well be stepping down. So John Roberts, um, well, has, has, I think, been frustrating for many conservatives. Uh, if, if a Democrat wins the White House, John Roberts may well be writing a lot more dissents on the other side because the court and its membership um, is, is really something that could be in flux. So on that happy note, Mr. You, who's next? Mike Carvin. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on that happy note. Um, the first point I think to be made is it's really a bit of a misnomer to talk about the Roberts Court or the Rehnquist Court or any other court. Really, the Chief Justice is just one of nine votes. If he had joined eight liberal justices, he'd have an entirely different legacy than if he joined eight conservative justices. And to pick up on the judge's remark, I mean, really, I think it's probably more accurate to say Prior to 2005, it was the Kennedy-O'Connor court. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's been largely the Kennedy court because he, more than any other justice, is going to dictate the direction of the law. Um, I'm worried that it could become the Kennedy-slash-Roberts court um, if the kind of jurisprudence he brings to the Affordable Care Act tends to bleed over into other areas of the law, then it, we're going to have some uh, very rough sledding. Um, I think it's probably, as Jan said, too early to tell on that. But the real consequential thing that happened 10 years ago, frankly, was not uh, John Roberts replacing uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, it was Justice Alito replacing Justice O'Connor, because then you had a principled conservative replacing, you know, sort of a suburban Republican state legislator, uh, and you got some continuity in the law and some principle in the law, and, um, and that, that has affected some of the, the various areas that I'd like to chat about briefly here. Um, the first things I'd like to talk about is the substance of some of the things we've seen over the last 10 years, and then just kind of a jurisprudential approach, uh, an approach to judging and, and how uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, differs from people like uh, Scalia and Thomas. So in terms of the scorecard, how have the last 10 years looked, I'd say, you know, I'll start with the good stuff because I'm an eternal optimist. I think that uh, we've made some baby steps towards uh, the return to the rule of law. Um, and obviously, as Jan points out, if the election goes wrong and, uh, next year, then none of that will matter and we will descend into a hellish existence from which we will never emerge. Uh, uh, but for right now, you know, you can make an argument that has some relationship to the text structure and history of the Constitution that people actually listen to. Is, uh, so that's nice. Um, and I'd like to just go through briefly uh, uh, the areas where I think we've made some uh, decent progress and then some of the worst uh, uh, parts of, of the Roberts Court. Um, I'll start with free speech. I think generally it's been a very good development. Uh, again, I'm just going to touch on each of these very lightly. Citizens United was uh, a brilliant decision, a landmark in restoring individual liberty and uh, enhancing the marketplace of ideas. Generally, they've taken a very libertarian approach in all areas of speech, commercial speech. There was a decision called Sorella against Vermont where uh, um, they uh, certainly reinforce some basic principles of, of uh, free speech. A case called Alvarez, somewhat controversial, but made the point that, listen, at least with respect to political and ideological and scientific debates, even knowing falsehoods are constitutionally uh, protected, and the reason for that is because we don't want to allow an Orwellian truth ministry to govern uh, the marketplace of ideas. Again, um, the dynamic in this area and in just about every other area I'm going to talk about is these reflect Justice Kennedy's jurisprudential inclinations. The court can basically go as far as Justice Kennedy wants to go and no farther, uh, except with respect to the Affordable Care Act, but I'll come back to that. But, but basically, if Justice Kennedy has a basically libertarian approach uh, to the First Amendment, um, that's where the court's going to go. We had a step backwards last term, which was probably the worst term since the 1970s. Uh, where Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion 
uh, very restrictive opinion about the rights of judges uh, to solicit campaign contributions. You can hopefully write that off as an anomaly that judges are different, so we're not going to really apply the First Amendment to them. But the mode of analysis, I don't want to get into the weeds, but his under-inclusive analysis was a dramatic departure from precedent, and, and if anybody takes it seriously, which I hope they won't, uh, could dramatically uh, undercut uh, some First Amendment protections. Um, the other aspect, of course, of the First Amendment that's important is uh, religion, and again, I think generally very good marks in terms of where the court has gone on that. Now, in terms of... Uh, enhancing religious liberty, enhancing the, the right of religious adherence relative to the state. Justice Scalia wrote this, in my mind, very controversial Smith opinion that defanged the protections of the free exercise claw that essentially, uh, clause that essentially said, unless they single out religion for differential treatment, they can impose any kind of neutral law, even if it has a dramatic burden on religious practice. So that area switched from the free exercise clause to the RIFRA, a statute which restores the protections that says you can't substantially burden the practice of religion um, uh, absent a compelling government interest. And there we saw, most notably last year in the Hobby, two terms ago in the Hobby Lobby case, where they had vindicated the rights of religious employers to resist the contraceptive and other mandates that were embodied in the Affordable Care Act. We saw a very similar uh, development, which was actually a departure, I thought, from Smith in this Tabor case, where they said even neutral regulations, you can't infringe on the religious autonomy of religious institutions. And so they departed from the notion in Smith that a neutral law would be okay as long as it was uh, generally applied. Seen some baby steps in the Establishment Clause area, Town of Greece, you can mention God and things like that. Um, uh, in public forums, uh, to, at least if you have a strong history of doing so. I think the real issue on the Establishment Clause that the court is not yet confronted and I think will be the ad litmus test in terms of whether or not they're going to take a sensible approach to the Establishment Clause is it has not been firmly established and it certainly should be. Uh, that it doesn't violate the Establishment Clause if you give religious organizations funding pursuant to a neutral funding scheme. In other words, you don't have to affirmatively discriminate against religious organizations when you're doling out social welfare money. I think that's the one part of the religious agenda that has not yet been resolved. I have a strong degree of confidence that there will be five votes for that if it, uh, if it comes up. The next area is, has definitely been a mixed bag, and that's, of course, uh, racial equality. Um, I thought that the biggest change we would dramatically see when Justice Alito replaced Justice O'Connor was in the area of racial preferences. Justice O'Connor in the Michigan cases had famously said, we're going to take a 25-year vacation from the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can discriminate all you want against uh, anybody who uh, the government doesn't think is a protected minority group. Um, and we'll get back to me and we'll talk about whether or not that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I suspect Justice Alito does not uh, share that uh, uh, discriminatory view of the 14th Amendment. So uh, we're going to find out this term in the Fisher case, which presents again the issue of racial preferences in higher education so sort of dramatically re revisits um, what Justice O'Connor did in the Michigan cases. There's a number of ways that you could restore some teeth to the protection of non-minorities against state-based racial discrimination without affirmatively overturning the Michigan cases by, simply by saying things like, look, if you're invoking uh, critical mass and diversity and these other buzzwords, maybe you could supply some evidence that um, achieving 14% uh, minority representation relative to 10% minority representation actually has some educational value. And since there's a complete absence of any evidence to support that extraordinarily counterintuitive notion, um, it, as long as they demanded some proof as opposed to slogans, um, then I think they could go a long way towards restoring uh, the racial neut neutrality command of the Constitution. Uh, again, Fisher's an interesting test case because it bubbled up a couple of years ago. Supreme Court waited nine months to issue a four-page opinion that literally said nothing except, why don't you take another look at this? The Fifth Circuit quite predictably said, okay, we've taken another look at it and sent it back up. Uh, and this time, I, 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 I think it'll be interesting to see if they actually uh, put some teeth, restore some teeth again to the 
to the equal protection analysis. In the statutory realm, there's been some very good decisions in the Voting Rights Act, and the, the big surprise and the big step backwards, which was attributed, attributable to Justice Kennedy last term, was he read an effects test into Title VIII, the, the Fair Housing Act, which uh, prohibits fair housing discrimination, which was a real surprise to me because, at least in the employment and the voting area, Justice Kennedy had seemed to firmly understand and adopt the position that the effects test is, is just another word for a racial quota and that we shouldn't turn statutes which say don't take account of race into statutes that say you must take account of race and, and sort out uh, government benefits on a racially proportionate basis. Um, but then last year in the Title VIII case in Texas, he took a big step backwards on that. He laced his opinion with saying, now don't, don't turn this into a quota, but HUD about a week later issued a bunch of regulations which did turn it into a quota, so that'll tell you about as much effect as Justice Kennedy has there. Again, I do think, for the reasons I've just articulated, the court's decision in Fisher this year will tell you a lot about how they're going to handle racial issues uh, going forward, both in terms of the uh, statutory and non-statutory um, context. I think the final uh, big step forward in terms of uh, uh, jurisprudence and adhering to the rule of law over the last 10 years was Heller, the decision recognizing that the Second Amendment actually does protect individual rights to own uh, firearms. The actual practical effect of that opinion, I think we don't know yet because they've never taken a, a follow-on case to sort through the kinds of gun regulations that are out there and the kind of judicial scrutiny they've given to it, but it was clearly a, a huge originalist win um, uh, in a closely divided court, so that was certainly probably the best thing that uh, uh, this court has done. On the bad side, um, obviously last year's decision in the same-sex marriage case was about as lawless as you could be. Um, the provision that Justice Kennedy invoked says uh, you can't deny, um, excuse me, life, liberty, or property without due process of law, which of course to all English-speaking people means uh, people of the same sex must be able to marry. Uh, uh, he, he supported this keenly attuned textual analysis with uh, platitudes that I think came from Hallmark greeting cards. Uh, 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 so it really didn't pretend to be what we are usually accustomed to in terms of overriding the democratic choices and five millennia of tradition um, uh, of most major religions. The one, and I obviously have a distinct prejudice on this, but the, the other I think hallmark of lawlessness uh, over the last 10 years was to distinguish, was the case in King versus Burwell, which I argued. Um, in many ways, it was really worse than the first NFIB decision, which had upheld uh, the Affordable Care Act, because, as I think Stephen was pointing out, you could attribute that to a normal conservative def, I mean, wrongly, but you could at least argue plausibly that this was deferring to Congress and they, and they didn't want to, in a presidential election year, strike down landmark social legislation. Uh, but there was really no such excuse in terms of interpreting a statute, uh, uh, the plain language of the statute, and having six members of the court, state doesn't mean state, it means federal, was very reminiscent of what the court was doing in the 70s, particularly with respect to the Civil Rights Act under cases like Weber and Griggs, where they said North meant South, East meant West. Um, and I thought that the one thing we'd accomplished in the late stages of the Rehnquist Court and, and, and certainly in the Roberts Court was to interpret statutes at least to have some relation to the plain meaning of the text. Uh, constitutions live and grow and you know, there's the argument that you shouldn't defer to the policy choices of a couple of hundred years ago by dead white men, but these were the policy choices of the legislature from four years ago, and um, there was really no excuse other than a naked policy preference uh, to, to change what the law meant to the, to the opposite of what it meant. Uh, the other issue, and again, this is where Chief Justice Roberts has probably departed most starkly from the rule of law was the NFIB case, which upheld the constitutionality of, uh, of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I'm trying not to take either of these decisions personally, but uh, for those the fascist 
the school of uh, fascist conspiracy theories could think he just doesn't like me, so he only departs from the text when, when, when I'm available, and maybe that will give us some solace for, for future cases. Uh, uh, the other areas, I think, have been less dramatic in terms of their um, departures from the text. Um, Eighth Amendment, we've seen a lot of arguments where the court is essentially establishing a code for states in the death penalty and life without parole context where they're dictating to uh, elected representatives of the states how they need to treat relatively young or relatively mentally challenged uh, murderers and, um, and establishing a kind of code with, uh, with the gout again. Any serious argument that the punishment, punishment being inflicted is cruel or unusual. And another opinion from last term that, again, may, is not terribly unpredictable in terms of its consequences, but was really a naked assault on the text of the Constitution was the Arizona redistricting case where they said legislature meant popular sovereignty, didn't mean legislature. I commend to you, this was literally two days after the King decision came down, I commend to you Chief Justice Roberts uh, stirring dissent about how they, how dare they distort the meaning of the word legislature to achieve the broader purposes of the Constitution. Uh, again, proving yet again that the Supreme Court is an irony-free zone and, um, uh, and again, maybe uh, confirming the personal animus theory that I'm, I'm coming, to, <laughs> coming to adopt. Um, so those are the big picture substantive areas. In terms of the approach to judging, I'd, I'd say I think the biggest difference between Chief Justice Roberts, for example, and the conservative members of the court, particularly Justice Scalia and Thomas, is an emphasis on incrementalism where he wants to take a step at a time. And I could walk you through how he's done that in a variety of contexts. Fisher is actually an example where they took a small step and may come back to it. Uh, the Shelby County decision striking down Section 5 again preface by uh, certain small steps. This term, they're going to decide a case, Friedrichs, which I'm actually arguing, where in Knox and Harris, they had cast great doubt on the constitutionality of commanding agency fees in public unions from people who don't belong to the uh, union on First Amendment grounds. And now they've got a, a case that squarely presents the question of whether you should overturn precedent that had uh, previously upheld it. Uh, I don't think that. Um, I'm not entirely sure why there should be a conservative principle that says incrementalism is preferable to um, uh, a Scalia-like approach. Uh, the point I always make is um, you could have certainly in 1954 written Brown v. Board of Education to say that the black schools were clearly unequal to uh, the white schools and upheld uh, Plessy v. Ferguson's uh, law about separate but unequal, but nonetheless struck down these laws because they didn't satisfy the Plessy standard. The problem with that kind of incrementalism is that reflects is you're keeping in place a foundational premise which is contrary to the text structure and history of the Constitution, which can't be in the long run good for the coherent development of uh, the law or much less uh, the institutional integrity of the court. And that's what I'll, the last point I'll, I'll I'll make, picking up on Stephen's point about how Justice Roberts, there was some ambiguity during his confirmation hearing about whether he was uh, worried about the institutional integrity of the court. And in my mind, any time you hear a justice or a judge talk about the court as opposed to the law, that sends up a real warning signal because if you want to enhance the institutional integrity of the court, just do law, just do it, and do it in a neutral way where umpires are calling balls and strikes in a neutral manner. If you start changing your view of the law or modifying your view of the law because you're worried about public perceptions of the court, that can only invite the notion that you're not neutrally interpreting uh, the text of the legal materials in front of you, but you are injecting a thumb on the scales that favors uh, uh, one party or another or one policy view over another. And in the long run, that by definition decreases the institutional integrity of the court because it just reduces the court to another uh, legislative body where uh, decisions are made based on whose ox is being gored rather than uh, uh, neutral principles. So that was always a worrisome sign. Again, I think it's too early to tell 
which way uh, Chief Justice Roberts' uh, jurisprudence will develop. Generally, it's been very favorable. There have been a notable uh, couple of exceptions to that. I'm hoping those will stay in the anomalous category, uh, but we don't know. And again, if we lose the next election, it won't matter at all. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to be here. The Federalist Society has been a part of my life and existence since 1982 when I arrived at Yale and discovered that they were creating this institution. I'm not exactly a founding father of the Federalist Society, but I think I'm a founding nephew of the <laughs> second generation and I've been at many of these events and I, I really love this organization. I'm gonna build on a lot of what Michael Carvin has said. He stole some of my thunder, but then I'm gonna move on beyond that to think about things about the future of the Robert court. Now the title that I've given uh, my remarks is a, is a question. I have a handout. What kind of law professor would it be if you didn't have an assignment? Don't worry, there won't be a test on this. The question is, what's conservative about the Roberts Court? And I agree with Mike that uh, the, the, the idea of marking the beginning of periods or epochs of Supreme Court from this, the chief justiceship of a single individual is in some ways distorting. Um, but it is convenient. It is a convenient marker. So I want to look at the personnel changes of the past four years and ask the question, has the court really become ideologically more conservative in its composition? My answer is no. Not very much. There's been not much of an ideological change in the composition of the court since 2005 when John Roberts was first sworn in. So first consider the composition of the court as it stood. We've heard as little of some of this, but basically you had three solid conservatives, Rehnquist, Scalia, and Thomas. You had a solid block, pretty much, of four reliable liberals, Ginsburg, Breyer, Stevens, and David Souter, who had crept left before finally lurching left. And by the time of uh, 2005, he's he solidly in the liberal bloc. And then you had two swing justices, or so-called swing justices, O'Connor and Kennedy. I'd prefer to call them weather vane justices because they, they kind of swing with the prevailing political and cultural winds. They had conservative instincts, at least in certain respects, but they did not have principled, coherent, or consistent judicial philosophies. So you had three conservatives, four liberals, two, uh, and two swing votes. And then uh, you have the, the substitutions. And I, I lay out my little lineup card. You have the substitution of Roberts for Rehnquist, and I think that's pretty much a wash. You have a generally mainstream for the most part consistently conservative jurist replacing another mainstream consistently conservative jurist. The switch from Roberts to Rehnquist it basically ends up being the same. The material change, I agree with Mike and, and, and with Jan, is that uh, is, uh, of Sam Alito for Justice O'Connor. Now in some sense that's a little unfair. It's like a double switch in baseball. They came in at the same time. Roberts was initially gonna be for O'Connor and then he's bumped up to the chiefship. And we had this little episode that dominated October 2005 where uh, Bush was flirting with a different uh, nominee, but then uh, on Halloween, I think it was, that Alito was finally put forward as a nominee. And that's the material change because I think it does substitute a solid judicial conservative for a liquid judicial conservative, or sometimes a gaseous one. Just, you know, O'Connor was just not a principled solid conservative. So the net change is you've moved from one of the swing justices into one that's more in the four, fairly reliable camp. So you have now a four, one, four, and that makes a difference where Kennedy would have voted with the conservatives anyway. There's some issues in which Kennedy leaned conservative. There's some issues in which O'Connor leaned conservative. The material changes are when you substitute Alito's vote for O'Connor's vote, and Kennedy was going to be with the conservatives anyway. And that's basically the list, and Michael did such a good job on the list that I'm just gonna bullet point it um, as quickly as I can. My theme is that the changes have been few and far between. Uh, there have been relatively few conservative victories, and they've been interspersed between uh, a lot of important and dramatic liberal victories and defeats for the Constitution. So a quick canvas of the cases. These are all cases, or mostly cases, where Kennedy leaned right and O'Connor less so, and the change from uh, 
from O'Connor to Alito made a material difference. One Mike mentioned is campaign finance, the switch from McConnell versus FEC, which was a First Amendment disaster, to Citizens United, which is a First Amendment triumph, is probably the single most notable change uh, affected, and the switch is, is attributable to Alito's vote. There's been an incremental shift in abortion. The court struck down Nebraska's partial birth abortion ban in 2000 and upheld on the narrowest of grounds the 2000, in 2007 the federal ban on partial birth abortion. It's a baby step. Similarly, baby steps on racial preferences might cover that. Uh, the court is moving in the right direction, but so incrementally it's sometimes hard to see. Religious freedom, uh, there has been, I think, a very important change. The Hosanna-Tabor case, unanimous Supreme Court decision, which I think undermines in principle the premises of the Employment Division versus Smith case and will hopefully become very important in the future. I know there's an afternoon panel devoted almost exclusively to the issue of religious freedom. In addition, Sam Alito's opinion for a majority in the Hobby Lobby case, 5-4, holding Kennedy, uh, was extremely important in its interpretation of RIFRA and its recognition of broad rights of religious freedom and religious conscience as against government regulations. Um, a little mixed result, as Mike said, on, uh, on the scope of the government's enumerated powers. I'm one of the few Federalist Society heretics that actually thinks that NFIB versus Sibelius was rightly decided. It doesn't conform with my policy preferences, but I think that the best interpretation I'm, I'm of the- go. Thank oh. you though. Okay. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that thing. But one, one important thing to note is that even in defeat, there is a conservative victory for constitutional federalism in that the court did adopt a majority of justices, a narrow interpretation of the scope of the commerce power, put meaningful limits on the necessary and proper clause, and had a dramatic uh, 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 new restriction on the scope of the use of the government spending power to coerce states into adopting federal programs. So I think that's meaningful. On executive power, a case Mike didn't mention is the Utility Air Regulatory Group versus EPA case, which I think is huge for separation of powers. It says, surprisingly enough, that the president cannot rewrite laws of, con of Congress just to effectuate desired policy outcomes when the laws don't say what they want. It's a Scalia opinion, it's brilliant, it is important, and I think that's uh, one of the sleeper victories. In the category of other sleeper victories, you know, this is the litigation practice group. And my day job is as a civil procedure professor. Sorry, I don't mean to bring back bad memories of the Erie Doctor or anything. But there have been meaningful changes in the law governing pleading, standing, and territorial jurisdiction, which I think will have a practical impact in uh, changing the way uh, litigation is conducted in, in federal courts in, in, in the future. These victories have been few, and they've been interspersed far between uh, uh, dramatic liberal results. Uh, some of the most uh, awful cases, I think, have been the war prisoner cases from the Bush administration era. The Hamdan case, the Boumediene case, absolutely indefensible and precursors of the indefensible decisions in the same-sex marriage cases, both the Windsor case in 2013 and, of course, Obergefell. Um, the four Democratic appointees in the Supreme Court are a solid block. When Kennedy joins him, it is not any, in any meaningful sense the Roberts Court, it is the Kennedy Court. So I'd like to conclude with lessons for the next conservative president, or at least the next conservative president who cares in a meaningful way about the Constitution, sort of look forward, hopefully, cheerfully to the next 10 years of the Roberts Court. Um, as Jan mentioned, on Inauguration Day 2017, there will be three justices in their 80s, one in his late 70s, and there's going to be an opportunity for, in all likelihood, some meaningful changes, and those will be important. Ideology matters. Judicial philosophy matters. The Supreme Court wields substantial government power, and what your philosophy is as to the proper use of that government power makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to the country, to the future of the nation, to your faithful stewardship of the Constitution, and sometimes it's literally a matter of life and death who you appoint to the Supreme Court. It makes a world of difference, for example, 
that we ended up with David Souter rather than Edith Jones or Lawrence Silverman in 1990. I think if you have Edith Jones appointed by a Republican president, I think Roe versus Wade is overruled by a vote of six to three or seven to two because the weather vanes swing the other way. Um, and it's a difference uh, if you have this conception that uh, in terms of saving millions of lives. Uh, it makes a huge difference whether in 1987 you succeed in confirming a Robert Bork or a Douglas Ginsburg instead of ending up with Anthony Kennedy. And it obviously makes a huge difference whether you have a Sotomayor or a Sutton or a Sessions. It makes a difference whether you have a Kagan or a Kavanaugh or a Cruz. Um, ideology matters, and I know the objection will come, and here I'd like to get back and forth with Steve on it, um, that sometimes you can't really know in advance judicial philosophy, and sometimes it's considered not proper to ask or that it is not politic uh, to press that position. Uh, my answers are, yes, you can know judicial ideology in advance, fairly reliably, and yes, it is proper and necessary to ask. Of course you can know how these individuals will be as justices on the Supreme Court. I, 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 I don't think it's bragging or, or any sort of uh, special skill, but really give me 10 minutes with a prospective nominee and I'll tell you how they're likely to be on the Supreme Court I will not have everything right, but they will not disappoint well-settled expectations based upon an interview that puts straightforward ideological uh, uh, questions to them. You can tell in advance the difference between a Scalia and a Souter. And of course, it's proper to ask these questions. You know, sometimes we fetishize this idea of judicial independence. Judicial independence in the Constitution is a function of life tenure and salary guarantees, which then is supposedly the assurance of decisional autonomy once someone is confirmed. The other side of the Constitution is that it enshrines an explicitly political appointment and confirmation process as part of the separation of powers and checks and balances. I think it then becomes the obligation, the constitutional duty of the president considering a nomination, of the Senate in considering whether to confirm, to press what they understand to be the proper views of constitutional interpretation with all the powers and energy at their disposal. Um, <clears throat> I think it's possible to know what uh, a justice will yield, and I think it the, actually favor the most extreme version of litmus tests. I think if you give me just one question to ask an individual justice that will yield the maximum amount of information about their judicial philosophy, I'll say, what do you think of Roe versus Wade? It'll tell me whether they think the judges can make constitutional rights. It'll tell me something about their theory of precedent and stare decisis. It'll tell me about their theory of the relationship of judicial power to legislative power. It is entirely appropriate, I submit, as a constitutional matter to push these questions forward and that that should be obligatory on the next uh, uh, president. I'm gonna leave it there so that we have some time to go back and forth, but thank you very much for your attention. We're gonna have a, a period of questions and answers and uh, as uh, chairman, uh, I appoint myself to start. Uh, first, uh, Steve, we have the two ACA cases um, and the interpretation that what is not a tax on Monday is a tax on Wednesday um, in the first case and that the word state includes the word federal uh, in the second case. And then we have the Arizona case where the word le legislature in, includes a non-legislative enactment. Uh, <clears throat> question, is textualism now dead? And did Mr. Uh, Judge, then Judge Roberts give any indication uh, of what his views were on textualism when he was confirmed? Uh, thank you. I, I really don't think he did. I mean, I, I, I have the, the poll quotes there and, uh, and and the, the hearing transcript, and you get some hints, you know, and as I said, it is a little bit 
odd to go backwards and look because you find yourself looking for it, and so you don't really know how it's received at the time. Uh, but there, I mean, as I went through it and I was reviewing it again uh, and thinking back on it, I don't remember it squarely, textualism squarely being teed up, and there was no substantial, significant discussion about what that would look like, other than, of course, you start with the text of the statute and then you have this conversation about legislative history, but the extent to which you would focus on the text and what the, what the words can mean something different. No, it's not squared up. I, I had a note to myself, actually. We had no discussion that I could find of taxing power, uh, that anything like the first uh, ACA case. So uh, these questions don't get teed up, and part of that is because, well, to your question, no, that wasn't, and it's odd looking back that it wasn't. Uh, I also think that these, I mean, look, these hearings take place in a certain moment in time. I mean, Kilo had come out a few months earlier, and so there was a g lot of discussion of Kilo. Uh, you, oh, it's always the more recent cases, and so insofar as the Commerce Clause was discussed, it was all the Raish case uh, being discussed at the same time, and that, what, what does that mean? And people are thinking of it in a very narrow sort of way based on the last case. Everyone's fighting the last war uh, in terms of, of all of this. So. To answer both of you, well, you asked one question, but I asked, answered a second one, uh, which is to say that I, th I don't know if it's dead, but it, the, the members, the senators are not, they don't seem, I don't say equipped, but they don't seem inclined to engage in a sustained conversation about specific doctrines of interpretation. It's very it, difficult for them to do that in that cross-examination sort of format that you'd have to do. And so as a consequence, as I, as I said in my remarks, they they don't get elaborated upon uh, very much, and you're able, as a, as a nominee, to sit there and have very simple sorts of views about, and I'm not, not simplistic, but simple and straightforward and clear views about not inserting policy preferences without ever having to explain the contours of how you get there. And Mike's nodding, so maybe I'm not completely off. I don't know. Uh, no, just to supplement the point. I mean, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but let's face it, the most members of the Senate Judiciary Committee are not jurisprudential giants. They've, they've got a day job. They're not supposed to know the nuances of, of how you parse things. And then there's just the normal institutional interest, right? You have a Republican nominee the people who would be most interested in ensuring that this person was, quote, conservative would be the Republican senators, but they're not going to engage in a hostile kind of cross-examination of, of a president of theirs party's nominee. And third, look, uh, John Roberts and Sam Alito could run circles around anyone who did try and do it. Roberts gave a superb performance as a confirmation, but actually I think Alito... I mean, he enveloped the committee in the warmest bath of boredom that anyone has ever seen. <laughs> and they would be asking him these incredibly hostile questions, and he'd be like, yes, and there's Smith v. Jones, and I mean, a minute and a half into it, everyone. <laughs> so, and, and that's how he completely diffused him. So the notion that some Democratic senator, particularly Joe Biden, is going to figure out uh, Sam Alito's jurisprudence is just, I, I think, quite unrealistic. Jan, you, you were I there. Know, I mean. If you think, I mean, to, to, I, would, I want to hear more from you about mm -hmm. how you figure out, uh, you know, who's going to be a yeah. solid judicial, that, you know, because, I mean, think about how John Roberts um, answered the question about Roe and was it settled law. He was said, yes, it is settled law subject to principles of stare decisis. Yeah. Now, I mean, Democrats are like, okay, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and Republicans were like, yes. You know, I mean, they heard different things. And of course, John Roberts said absolutely nothing. I mean, that means that's a meaningless. Yeah. And, but people heard in that different things because, to Mike's point, they're members of the Senate Judiciary Committee and not, <laughs> uh, and you got 26 minutes with Joe Biden, but uh, well, wait, Let's give an example. So uh, I, I'm not going to pull the, the tr full quote here, but I commented on this issue with uh, North by Northwest and Dr. Zhivago. So if any, no one laughs, so you must not remember this. Uh, <laughs> it, this was a very funny, actually, moment, which was that Senator Schumer was completely and totally frustrated with the current U.S. attorney from New York sitting right behind him who had planned out this very careful, you know, cross-examination and trying to get at him and figure out 
what it was he thought about things. He says, this is exasperating. I ask you what your favorite movies are. And you say, well, I like movies with com that, are, that are comedies, and I like movies that are, that are dramas. And sometimes I like movies that have female leads, and I like the movies that have male leads. And, he, and, he, and he's exasperated with all this. And what happened was is that, uh, just for the, to complete the joke part of it, is that they ran out of time. And Senator Specter, Chairman Specter, was not inclined to give Senator Schumer any more time. And so because they ran out of time, the question was posed and then it wasn't answered. Uh, and, uh, and there was a little bit of back and forth about whether he could answer the question. And Judge Roberts said, no, I, I'm happy to answer the question. And then he leaned in and he says, Dr. Zhivago, North by Northwest. <laughs> you know? And Schumer was very angry about it, uh, as was his counsel. Um, I, I was sitting across the dais at the time watching them because they had really tried, and this is the second day, they had tried really hard to figure out how to pin him down and how to get enough information to be able to figure out more about his judicial philosophy, where he would, and they, in their case, they want to know explicitly how you're going to rule on a, on a, on a, on a, on a case. Uh, and um, here they thought they had him, and he just whew, slipped right by. And then when they got called, he got called on a little bit, he made a joke out of it. You know, and I think he was just being cheeky. Uh, but at the same time, uh, again, it was not a joke for Senator Schumer. It was not a joke for uh, uh, the others on the other side because they were very frustrated at not being able to draw it out. Sorry, Mike. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that the Senate confirmation hearings are the best method for drawing out judicial ideology. The place you do it is in one-on-one -on -one conversations between people who actually understand these issues and understand the right questions to be asking and to be looking for. Part of my critique is the way the administrations, at least in Republican administrations, have seemingly failed to put direct, simple, straightforward questions Mike, that would get at judicial philosophy. You don't figure that out in the interviews, right? They, they're going to lie. I, I did, I, 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 no, no, I did Reagan administration judicial screening. Here's how it went. Hi, how are you? I think Roe v. Wade should be overturned. Good. Would you like some uh, coffee? I mean, <laughs> there, there wasn't anybody who was going to say, yeah, I think Roe Ro is correctly decided. So you, you could get at their jurisprudence in different ways, but I think you need a track record, right? These guys have either engaged in public law in the Justice Department or a state attorney general or on the bench. Uh, and that's how you know how they decide. And Souter was a completely self-inflicted wound that was obvious quite obvious uh, when we did it, uh, when it was done. And uh, so I don't think it's that hard to tease out conservatives from non-conservatives. I think doing it in a, a crucible of a White House interview process is just quite difficult. And if you think about Justice Alito, I mean, he had that track record. I mean, you know, Bill Kelly concluded he had never written a wrong opinion. And his confirmation hearings, I think, can be uh, something when you think and look forward he was the big fight. I mean, that's right. He was nominated on Halloween. The Democrats, I mean, all the groups were like, oh, this is scary. It's a trick on the American people, all that stuff. He was the big fight. He was going to be replacing the pivotal vote. There was a track record. There were opinions. Uh, there were memos. Uh, there was Princeton. and I mean, on and on and on. And his performance in that hearing was so masterful. He was better than Roberts. <laughs> yeah. And in the hearing. And when Martha Ann Alito started crying, I mean, you couldn't have scripted that any better. I mean, the fight went out of the room. Alito, it was like they were ready. They were going to beat him. They were going to defeat this nomination. And they never were able to strike, like, get a spark, like, try to, never. I mean, he was, so I think when you, that is the nominee. And by the way, Sam Alito did not read one word of the briefing books that the White House prepared him <laughs> for that hearing. That was all Sam Alito. So the lesson, I think, if you're thinking about going forward and getting that nominee confirmed is track record, although that tends to be appellate court judges, but also thinking about the nominee at the hearing. I mean, Robert Bork could well be on the Supreme Court if they'd been Nicorette gum at the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, he was, that hearing, I mean, he was. Or if we'd sent him up in 86. Yeah. If, if well, we'd done Bork Scalia instead of Scalia Bork, we still had the, we still had the, no, we still had the Senate in 86, and uh, he would have gotten through, and Scalia turned out sailed through. So, yeah, little quirks like that uh, definitely affect it. Let me interrupt for a moment. Uh, we're going to have to close at uh, 145 punctually, and we left some time for questions from the audience. So if you have some questions, please stand up and go to one of the microphones. And when you ask a question, identify yourself and also identify the person, if you have one, who you wish to answer the question. All right? Uh, thank you. My name is Art Mackember. I am a real property attorney from Idaho. And the question is for the panel generally. 
Uh, the specific is, do you think the decision in Hobby Lobby necessarily drives the result for the new uh, Little Sisters of the Poor case? But the larger question is, does the Roberts Court ever move into a position where it doesn't merely use the Bill of Rights as a shield to give carve-outs to certain groups and starts to use it as a sword and say, no, you don't get to do that, Congress and the President. There is no power for you to do those things that you purport to do in, in some portions of the Affordable Care Act in particular. Uh, great question as to whether Hobby Lobby dictates the outcome in uh, Little Sisters of the Poor and all of these other contraception abortion mandate cases. Uh, the answer is, I hope so, but it all depends on what Justice Kennedy thinks. It's, it's Anthony Kennedy's world and we're just living in it. Um, as to whether or not more broadly the Supreme Court will move to a position of using a, a religious liberty as a way of disqualifying whole things that government does, I, I don't think so. I think the nature of the argument that's made for a broad understanding of religious liberty is that the right to free exercise of religion gives you the right to exercise religion in some respects differently from the rules that the government generally imposes. Okay? It is your individual freedom from government compulsion, but it usually does not entail a right to keep the government from otherwise doing what it's going to be able to do. Right, let's go to the microphone in the back. Justice Alito recently spoke to a Dallas Federalist Society gathering, and he mentioned his distress with some of the results in free speech cases. He mentioned, well, of course, he was the lone dissent in Snyder v. Phelps, and he also mentioned the Crush video case. He would like to see a distinction drawn, it sounded as if he was saying, between self-expression, unlimited self-expression, and free speech. Is, do you think that his position in, in the, encouraging this distinction um, that he'll be influential with the other conservative members of the court. And what current controversies in society might be decided differently if this becomes the case? You want to take a bite at that, Mike? Do I need? Uh, well, if, if no one else is out there wanting this one, I, I, I think that Justice Alito's narrow interpretation of freedom of speech in those cases really does make him an outlier within the court. It's not something he does very often, but he does have, in, in that aspect, the least pro-freedom of speech position of, of anyone on the court. Generally, though, he is an important and reliable voice for freedom of expression, freedom of speech. His dissent um, <clears throat> in the Christian Legal Society versus Martinez case was a powerful defense of freedom of expression and of freedom of expressive association, the freedom of groups to define their membership and their identity. And I think that's one of the important losses uh, during the Roberts Court era that, that hopefully will, will be overturned in the future. So, uh, just a footnote that. I think Justice Scalia is less libertarian in circumstances where the speech doesn't strike most people as speech. Like, Alito, uh, sorry, did I say, yeah, yeah. Justice Alito. Um, like, stepping on puppies' heads uh, and uh, uh, violent video games and things like that, which barely cross the threshold of being expressive. And I think what Justice Alito is arguing for is some kind of common sense ability to protect at least vulnerable members of society like kids from those sorts of destructive images. I don't think it's probably going to garner a majority of the court, but I think Justice Alito, to echo what Mike just said, is actually a very firm advocate of the First Amendment in contexts where we're talking about real speech, and particularly in areas where he thinks there's the chance for the government to engage in either subtle or express viewpoint discrimination, like on college campuses and the like, where he's very aware of the notion that uh, 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 speech that departs from the norm can be uh, burdened. Okay. All right. Next question. Yes. Um, Paul Kaminar. Uh, DC attorney, I have a question for Stephen and, and maybe Jan, a historical question. As we know, uh, Roberts was initially nominated for a Connor spot and then Chief Justice Rehnquist passed away and he was renominated for the Chief spot. Was there any consideration given to keep the Roberts nomination as the associate and to elevate Justice Scalia to the Chief spot just as Rehnquist himself was 
and you still would have been able to get Alito in there as well. The Republicans had controlled the Senate at the time. Before you, you, know, you would know, I'll say this. The Senate is remarkable, has very, very little information about what's going on uh, on the specifics of the nomination side. Uh, everyone assumes that they do. There are a handful of members which may have offline conversations, but they keep it at a purely member level, and I, you never hear about it after the fact. So my short answer is I have no idea. And but. my um, answer to that is no, that there wasn't, and Scalia did not appreciate it. Um, I think that his, I mean, you know, I don't know that he would have taken it, and now I think he would say, and he has said, that he enjoys the role he has on the court. It's, it allows him to be, um, you know, Scalia in his dissents. Uh, he can be outrageous on the bench, um, but no. I mean, what's interesting, I think, that another interesting question when you think to some of the, your points is, you know, everything has to kind of line up a certain way. I mean, it's like, you know, getting struck by lightning, getting a nomination to the court, um, and everything has to line up. The Senate has to, you know, be in the right, who, who's going to get that nomination depends on a Republicans or Democrats control of the Senate. And in this case, to me, I think the fascinating question is if Rehnquist <coughs> had stepped down when we all thought he was going to, and really he should have, um, would John Roberts have been the nominee? If Rehnquist had gone first, would he have then, and my guess is no. Um, but I think when the president saw Roberts performing as he did, um, and then with Rehnquist on the eve of his hearings passing away, it was a, he had kind of been tested. And so it was easy for the president to move Roberts into that spot, paving the way then, of course, for that legal um, powerhouse, Harriet Myers, which no one is mentioning her name, so I have to throw it out there. Uh, but then, of course, getting Justice Alito. But I think the court would look quite different had Rehnquist stepped down. Uh, I thought Harriet Myers was the most brilliant head fake <laughs> in American history. <laughs> We've got to do a woman. Let's throw Harriet out there for a few weeks and then sleep, uh, slip Alito in. I just high stakes poker, but I got to give him credit. That was brilliant. <laughs> okay, front microphone. So, um, in his dissent in Oberfeld, Roberts criticized. I think he named the Lochner <laughs> versus New York case like t more than ten times, and that's a case that more and more conservative legal scholars seem willing to embrace. And so I guess my question for the panel generally is, what role do you think that case will play in determining you know, the next appointee should a Republican win the election you know, in terms of the I opinions of that I case? I apologize, did you say Lochner? Yes. Yeah, I, I'd say zero. No, I mean, I just don't see anybody on the court, including uh, Justice Thomas, uh, going towards uh, uh, a notion of substantive due process that gives the same kind of protection to abortion, uh, to economic rights that has been given to abortion and that sort of thing, because they think, uh, I, in my view correctly, that Lochner was wrongly decided, and that while economic regulation of the sort we see prevalent in today's society is really, really stupid, um, that, that the Constitution doesn't deprive uh, states or federal government of the uh, of the ability to, to enact really stupid economic regulation. Okay, last question, and uh, to the uh, rear microphone. Yeah. Randy Elf, some of you talked about Citizens United. What is your sense of this? In cases like that, McCutcheon, Arizona Free Enterprise Club, Citizens United, Wisconsin Right to Life, who is the swing vote? Who's the last one to come on board? Well, I think you need to take those individually. We, we all know that there was a, a famous dispute between Justice Scalia and Chief Justice Roberts about a Wisconsin right to life. Uh, you, you know, again, uh, Scalia takes the approach that uh, uh, you need to destroy the village to save it. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts takes the Potemkin village approach, keep the structure there, but just uh, make sure that it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, as you can tell, I'm sort of on the Scalia side of that debate, that, that if there's a fundamentally, if there's a precedent that's fundamentally incompatible with basic First Amendment rights, then, that, then it should be cleaned up, not, not through this incrementalism step. So the, the long, that's a long answer to your question is, which I, I strongly suspect in light of what the published opinion said, that Chief Justice Roberts was reluctant to uh, take the st uh, steps that they ultimately took in Citizens United as quickly as Justice Scalia wanted him to take it, but ultimately he came around to it. Uh, and I, it's really interesting, talk about quirks, Jan. I mean, you know, uh, 
If the Solicitor General had not given the completely truthful answer that, yes, of course, this means you couldn't publish a book uh, uh, criticizing Hillary Clinton, the corporation couldn't do it, we may have had a different result in Citizens United, and that's what led to a question by Justice Alito, by the way, and that's what led to a lot of people rethinking it and uh, re-argument. So uh, I strongly suspect Justice, Chief Justice Roberts was the one putting the brakes on that. I strongly suspect he probably wanted to write a more narrow opinion in Citizens United, but once the momentum had developed to uh, overturn Austin, and, and restore the First Amendment to what it, it naturally meant, I, I think he went along with it. So. All right, I want to thank this uh, wonderful panel, and it's 1.45, and I've got my marching order, so thank you very much.